Uh, well, it's not whether it's a function, it's whether it's a linear function. Okay. Um, whether or not it's a function is a good question, though. What does it mean to be a function? Yeah, Jessica? Each input has only one value. Right, so you put something in, and what do you get out? One thing. Not two things, not zero things, but one thing. So um, let's think about that for just a second. When you cube a number, is it possible to get two different answers when you cube a number? They tell you to take a number and multiply it by itself three times. Are there two things going to come out? No. Well, no. It's only going to be one way to multiply five times five times five, or negative six times negative six times negative six. Only one thing is going to come out. So it's a function, but is it a linear function? Linear functions. look like this, <coughs> y equals mx plus b. They may not look like that to start with, but as you can rearrange it in some way, if it doesn't look quite like that yet, then <coughs> it is a linear function. So if it looks like that, it's linear. If it doesn't, if it can't look like that, then it's not linear. Could you get this function to look like that? Why not then? Why couldn't you get it to look like this, Chloe? It has an exponent. Now this one does have an exponent. What's the exponent of this? One. It's one, but it's it's an exponent of one, not three. So this has an exponent of three, uh, in num number six here. Uh, this is f of x equals x cubed. Oh, I just lost it. Minus seven. All right. We do have a one times x, but <coughs> x is the third power. When you graph that, that is definitely not going to be a line. It's going to be a curvy thing. All right. So it's not linear. And then if we want to evaluate it for x equals negative 6, we just put negative 6 in there. We get negative 6 times negative 6 times negative 6 minus 7. It's 216. Negative 216 minus 7. Negative 223. That's what we get. Yes? What about the ones when they don't give you like a like 6 to fill in that x and they just say like graph it or something? If they say graph it, then it'll be a line because we only graph lines so far. Okay. Um, so, graph number five. Okay, so the thing about functions is they have an infinite, typically, an infinite number of solutions. I can put any number I want in here for x, so there'll be 1, 2, 3, 1 1.7, 2 All these numbers can go into the function, and then we see what comes out of it. We could do this forever and ever and ever. But we're kind of interested in <coughs> what types of relationships the inputs have to the outputs. Uh, that's what we'll, be we'll, we'll want to know for like the rest of this year. We'll be examining what is this function like? What does it do? What are its characteristics? What's its behavior like? Okay. So this one is just a specific number, negative 6, they wanted you to put in. You could have put anything you wanted in there. For a graph, a graph is, is just that. It's putting everything you could possibly put into this function and seeing everything that could possibly come out. Okay. Now, the graphs that we can put on our papers are obviously limited. You can't show infinity on your paper, okay? But you can get an idea of what this graph will do once it leaves the page, right? So in this small area uh, where the, the origin is located or near the origin, we're going to look at what this function uh, or how it behaves, what it looks like. Okay, so we talked about this uh, at length before. This is the y-intercept. If I put in 0 for x, 1 fifth times 0 is going to just leave me 3, so I get the point 0, comma 3. That's why that's the y-intercept. Plug in 0 for x, you get out 3. Okay? And the next number I would want to bother even putting in here, even though I could put in any number, 1, 2, 3, 4, I could put anything in there. If I put 5 in there, though, why is 5 a nice number to plug in for x in this function? The denominator is also 5, so it'll cancel with that 5, making the multiplication a lot easier and the addition of 3 a lot easier. So 1 fifth times 5 is 1, plus 3 will give us 4. So we start to notice that the pattern is we'll go up 1, for every 5 that we move over. And we can just keep going. We can plug in 2, or not 2, but uh, 10. And 10 times 1 fifth will be 2, so now we'll add 2 to 3, and we'll go up another one. 
And then we'll go over another five and we'll go up another one. We'll go over another five and up another one, and that's that slope for you. And there's a graph. And remember, like I said, a graph is just a way to show Ooh. all of these inputs and outputs, all the possible inputs and outputs that there are in you know the entire universe for this function. And that's the reason why we put these arrows here, because we're just saying, and it'll continue like this forever and ever and ever. Okay? So there's that one. Then there's uh, a function, a linear function that's written like. Just look at that, number 13. This is written a little differently. x plus y <coughs> equals 5. We all know that by now we just need two points to graph a line. So we find those two points that are easiest. That would be by, if you plug in 0 for x, then the x part goes away. And you just solve for y, and y is already 5. That's convenient for this problem. If it wasn't just y equals 5, if it was 2y equals uh, 16, divide by 2, and you find y is 8. We do the same thing, we plug in y is 0, okay, now y goes away, and x is 5, so we get the point 5, comma 0. And then we draw a line between those two points. Okay. What's another question? Um, I don't have anything to tell you what number it is, but the one to the top. Okay. Okay, so negative square root of 3 and 13 fourths. Let's just use our, our intuition, because what it's asking us is uh, the following number lines shows the graphs of negative square root of 3 and 13 over 4. So what's 13 over 4 close to? Three. Close to what? Three. To three, why three? Because 13 is close to 12. 13 is close to 12, and 12 divided by 4 would be 3. Mm -hmm. So it would be a little more or a little less than 3. Mm -hmm. 3 and 1 4, so a little bit more than 3. Okay, so we look on the number graphs, or the, 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 the line graphs here, and look for one that's a little bit more than 3. And actually, A is the only one that even has a number that's close to positive 3, so None of the other ones are even possible. We can look at square root of 3. What's square root of 3 close to? Yeah. The square root of 1 is 1, and the square root of 4 is 2. So somewhere between 1 and 2 is the square root of 3. Uh, so somewhere like negative 1 point something, um, and that just further confirms it. A has both those points. A little, a little bit more than 3, uh, a little bit past negative 1 <coughs> square root of I rarely ever want to just show you how I would do it. So what, what did you start to do something? Did you have an initial idea? No, I didn't get that far. I'm just confused. Okay. So what ideas do we have to start? When you distribute Okay. And so, uh, yes, fine. But not, it's not a matter of wouldn't you, like, sh should you do that? It's just, could you? You could. So you could do that uh, legally. So if that makes sense to you, you should do that. Equals, essentially, distribute the one fourth. Now what do we do? Subtract three fourths. Subtract three fourths, okay. <coughs> All right, so now one fourth y equals. Say six and one fourth, because that's true. Now, what do we do? You get y by itself. Multiply by four. Okay, multiply this side by four. 
multiply this by 4. So why? Now how do we multiply this by 4? So it just canceled the 4 would be 6? You're left with 6? Uh, well that's interesting because if I were to multiply 4 by something to get 6, when I multiply it by 6 fourths, See, those fours cancel and we're left with six is the answer, right? Brett? You have to make six and a quarter improper. Right, perfect. So uh, let's go back and <coughs> make it improper. So what would this be as an improper fraction and how do we know that? What's that? 25. 25, because you do four times six mm -hmm. plus one, 25 mm -hmm. over four. Now we multiply by four, now we cancel the four and we're left with 25. We're done. Uh, real quick, an alternate way of doing it is as long as what we want to do is mathematically possible, we, we can do it. Uh, if we multiply both sides by 4 to start with, that should be a 4. If I multiply this side by 4, I'm just, this is 4 <laughs> times 1, 4 times y plus 3. So I can multiply this 4 to, by y plus 3. I can distribute it if I wanted to, wanted to do that. Or I could just multiply 4 by 1 fourth. 4 by 1 fourth is nice because that's 1. So on this side, we just get y plus 3. On this side, we get 28. Subtract 3 on both sides, you get y is 25. And then we don't have to deal with fractions and all that kind of stuff, so that's another option. Uh, you can do lots of different things. I think probably these are the two most direct ways, most common ways. You could do all sorts of crazy stuff. And, get there eventually. Um, but there you go. There's, there's a couple ways. <laughs> okay. More questions before we get started? Um, hmm. What is the domain of the function of the graph? Uh, you have one in mind? 19 or 20? Or 21? Um, let's do 20. They give us a graph like this. Right. And I'm just going to draw the shape for now. And then they have like this thing right here. Do you know what this means? Scale break? Yeah, a break of some kind. Just whatever this is, what is this time? It doesn't say. Whatever the x variable is, we skip a bunch of values and we go right to 6. We don't go 1 through 6. We skip 1 through 5 and go right to 6. OK. So the domain, what's the domain? How do we define the domain of a function? The inputs. All the inputs. All the values that you can put into the function, OK? Well, let's look at this, for example. Uh, do you think 1 through 5 are in the domain? They're not even considered, right? That's not, they're ignoring them completely, all right? So where does this function exist? For what inputs do you see a graph existing? Yeah, the x-axis, not all of it, right? Because, I mean, that is where we find our inputs. That's right, yeah. Right? Inputs are on the horizontal axis, the x-axis. But not all of them are valid for this function, right? Not all of them, like, have something to reference. Not all of them have output. So which values of x will give you a y? Like, where does the graph exist? 6 through 11. So the numbers 6 to 11 are valid. If you go past 11, there's no more graph. Right? So you can't, once you go past 11, you go up and there's nothing there to find. And it goes to 11. Okay? So the domain is all the inputs, all the things you can put into the function. What's the range and what's the definition of the range? All the outputs. So we look at this graph, we look at this function, and we say, what outputs? are valid for this function. What outputs can you get out of this function? 40 and 80. What is that? 40 through 80. Uh, 40 through 80, right? Yeah, you can't, uh, you can't get 20. You know, there's, there's no graph at 20. You can't get 100. There's no graph at 100. 100's up here. And there's no graph up here. And there's no graph down here at 20. 
graphing this from 40 to 80. So if we were to draw a vertical line up from, well, let's say, from the edge of the graph, we would get down to 6, down to 11, if we go horizontally. So from there to there is our domain, from there to there is the range. So 40 to okay. So more questions before we start? We had 2x plus 7x equals uh, 81. What would we do first? Combine like terms. Combine like terms. These are like terms because they both have x's and they're both to the first power. So we get 9x equals 81. x equals 9. We divide by 9 on both sides. So we combine like terms. We put them together. Can we do that in this problem? Mm. Yes and no. Like not right now, but we could. They are like terms, so they can be combined. But there's something needs to happen before we can combine them. What needs to happen? Common denominator. What's that common denominator? Um, four. Four. Okay. So this one's already four. That's good to go. We need to multiply two by two to get four, and therefore we have to multiply the numerator by two. So two x over four. So we add them together. What do we get? Two x over eight. Or three x. Three x over. Four, because we're adding together fourths, and we're saying at the end we have this many fourths. We don't have a new kind of thing. We don't have so many eighths. Let's collect them together. Okay, how do we solve the rest of that? How do we solve for x now? Multiply by four. Multiply by four. Cancels out the fours. So now we get three x equals twenty. And then divide by three, and x is twenty over three. You might be wondering if back here if you can multiply by four thirds. Yep, it's the exact same thing as multiplying by four and then dividing by three. That's what multiplying by four thirds is, multiplying by four and dividing by three. But either way. Now it's 52. Any more? Uh, your pencil or pen and your calculator. I hope that if you need a calculator from me, you've already borrowed it, but if you need to borrow it, go ahead and borrow it. I have scratch paper uh, back there by the printer and over there on that metal shelf. Just half sheets of paper are always available for you. 